Um, and then I'll introduce you and you can begin. Okay, great, wonderful. All right, um, so good morning to everybody. Uh, we're lucky enough to have Dr. Robert Moldwin uh, today, who is a professor of urology at Hofstra Northwell um, for Northwell Health and specializing in interstitial cystitis and bladder pain syndrome. Thank you for being here, Dr. Moldwin. Um, to start off, just wanted to ask you how you ended up deciding uh, to focus on pelvic pain syndromes. Uh, yeah, that's sort of a long story. I, I won't be able to give my lecture then. You'll just have to listen to me. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, yeah, I wanted to go actually into do more general type urology, but ultimately actually Dr. Smith uh, recruited me back to our department uh, and basically just as a research area, uh, just to look into, no one had been doing it. I, I, I went into infectious disease for a year, just did some basic research. And in the process, I found this condition, this basically a non-bacterial cystitis, uh, as it was also termed. And uh, I thought it was like, it was an underserved population. Nobody was taking, obviously nobody was taking care. We didn't have good strategies of care. Uh, and it's, you always want to do something where you think you can make a difference. And uh, I think I have. Uh, and I think that um, over the time that I've been involved in the field, and hopefully we'll see today, uh, we've sort of come to different strategies that can help the, this whole patient population. I don't only do IC, I do just general urology, but also uh, you know, CP, CPPS, chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain syndromes, all these different sort of what I call the the, the gray area of medicine, uh, where medicine is still sort of a little bit of an art form. Um, we're trying to get into it, uh, get more quantitatively based, but it's it's uh, but it's uh, we're working on that. Yeah. All right. And uh, last question, and then we can get into your talk. But uh, any advice to um, the the residents or uh, uh, medical students on the line here about things that they should be doing? Uh, right now to prepare for their career long term? Well, you know, I, I think probably the most important thing to do is uh, you, you, you've chosen urology as your, your field. Uh, you have to think of your quality of life, uh, what you love to do. Um, you have to think about where your, your location, you have to think about who you're going to be practicing with. You have to think if you have a that that spark that would put you into academics versus you you want to do uh, more of a, a private practice situation what have you so you have to do what's going to you know you, you do have to think of yourself and and your family you can still take care of patients great no matter what you do um, as far as w where I think things have worked out well for me is that I love the niche that I have. I mean, I think it's always neat to be able to do something really, what you feel anyway is really good, uh, where you can make a difference uh, and you can contribute. I always tell you know my, my kids, uh, you know, if you're gonna do anything in this life, you wanna make a difference. And if you can in, in this field, then, then do, your best, uh, do your best to strive towards that. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, and uh, take it away, Dr. Moldwin. All right. So anyway, I was talking to Michael before about how, uh, you know, giving a lecture, I was thinking, well, they asked me talked about something about pelvic pain, interstitial cystitis, what should I, I talk about? And I was thinking just giving you an overview, but I decided that's sort of like giving a, a lecture on, you know, on, on whatever, prostate cancer. I mean, there are books written about it, and I'll never get through it. So I honed it down a little bit talking about, to talk about management strategies, but this clearly is, uh, you can go into any one of these individual topics. So my hope this morning is to give you guys a, uh, you know, some basic strategy, way to look at these patients uh, and get them uh, streamlined uh, to the best care possible, getting them feeling better. That's the main, the main goal here uh, to improve their quality of life. Uh, in the in the shortest in the straightest line possible. So with that said, let me. Uh, I guess I'll go through the slides here. You know the old disclosure slide, and you know this is sort of our world. Uh, the dilemmas of patient care, where patients come, uh, they have lots of symptoms, and that's where we get into that that gray area of medicine we call the area of functional medicine, where you just can't find anything. The CAT scan is negative. Certainly the urinalysis, all the testing that we do is all negative. 
and it comes down to, well, now what do you do? So here's uh, at least a, what I consider, this is sort of a takeoff of the American Urological Guidelines. This is, we published this in, in the current uh, uh, chapter in Campbell's, uh, where, and I'm not gonna really go into how to make a diagnosis because that really is a separate lecture. But in short, uh, you, have to, you have to start off with an ICD patient, uh, ICBPS, IC interstitial cystitis bladder pain syndrome patient. If you're missing the boat, then obviously none of these therapies may be helpful. So the, the basic algorithm is to suspect it with those typical symptoms. And it's sort of outlined here, but I just wanna to bring to your attention this middle area here with evaluate for confusable conditions or coexisting conditions. Um, there are lots of things that can give patients pelvic pain. Uh, a lot of patients even think urethral pain, but it's actually vaginal pain or some type of, you know, vulvar uh, pain syndrome, such uh, broadly termed vulvodynia. The overact, it's knee jerk. If a patient comes into a, a many urologists office and they have, you know, they just report, I go to the bathroom, I feel uncomfortable, you know, the whole story, uh, automatically they're an overactive bladder patient. But of course, those patients will probably fail the anticholinergics, the beta-3 agonists, and so forth. So, but, so you have to at least think about these things. Uh, it's, it's a younger patient, uh, usually younger patients, um, and they have gross inflammatory disease in their bladder. I want you always to consider a diagnosis of ketamine cystitis because this has become a, a, an increasing problem in the population over the past several years and also can easily be been dis, uh, can easily be misdiagnosed or just just uh, just not diagnosed at all. Um, of course, in uncomplicated, where the patient just has typical symptoms, increased pain with bladder filling, et cetera, uh, we can move on to some of this, these treatment strategies that I'll go over with you. Uh, but I want to make one thing, um, one deviation from typical American Urological uh, Association guidelines, and that is the role of cystoscopy, which we may see changing over the next several years because there's a lot of push uh, to rule out, uh, again, confusable disorders. And these are just some of the things that we may find in a bladder, even in the face, believe it or not, of a, of a negative urinalysis and negative culture. Uh, the lower is a, a surgical clip from an abdominoplasty. The middle one is a hunter lesions and only a hunter lesion, uh, which only about, uh, probably about 50% of patients will have some abnormality seen on urinalysis. And of course, uh, bladder stones or what have you. So uh, carcinoma in situ, all these different things. So again, I, I usually perform cystoscopy as part of the, uh, the initial evaluation of the patient. Also, it gives me an opportunity <clears throat> to go beyond just normally just looking in the bladder. One can get an idea. Can we reproduce the patient's level of discomfort where they're describing at home? Uh, with uh, with bladder filling in the office, do you need to do your dynamics? No, I don't. I don't think so. Uh, only I think in certain circumstances and with specific clinical indications, but cystoscopy and avoiding diary can really be very very helpful. I think at lining up the patient for better care. Uh, one thing, in, uh, specifically, if the patient does have a hunter lesion, which I'll get into later, uh, you know, the whole algorithm of care may change dramatically. Uh, again, uh, you need to be skeptical. I, when I first started in practice, I thought, I didn't think anybody had interstitial cystitis. I thought everybody pretty much had pelvic floor problems, uh, which were causing pain and, and all that. And the reality is then the patient started really coming through. They did have that pain with bladder filling, the negative urinalysis, they were voiding multiple times at night and, and so forth. But when you see a patient come in where the pain is not midline. Remember the bladder is a midline structure, so therefore usually the pain tends to be midline. It's very difficult and ill-described because it is visceral pain. That's the typical quality of pain that patients have. It's hard to exactly tell where it is. It's hard to describe, etc. Um, but uh, can you have pain on one side versus the other? Of course you can. If there's a, we often see that there's pain uh, from a, a hunter lesion that's on the right side, they may have more right-sided pain. But we have picked up patients with right-sided distal ureteral stones and so forth along the course of, uh, of care. Uh, pain that is not related to bladder empty, filling or emptying. Now, if you look at the AUA guidelines, it'll say pain perceived to be in the bladder. It doesn't actually say pain with bladder filling and modulates with bladder filling and bladder emptying, but as, as urologists, I think we really need to hone in on the bladder 
as a, as a pain generator itself. And I think that is one of the really helpful things. And when they, it's not that they can't have, it's, IC is out of the question if they don't have this finding, but one needs again to maintain a certain degree of skepticism. No nocturia. It's hard to explain why a patient would be voiding you know, uh, 30, 50 times per day and not and sleep through the night, of course. And one needs to wonder, is this some type of functional, uh, maybe pelvic floor related or what have you. Pain occurs during menstrual flow. Mo Interestingly, most ICBPS patients tend to have a, uh, a, uh, a premenstrual flare, uh, uh, but during their menstrual flow, they feel better. But when you feel, uh, which is sort of counterintuitive, but they do, and um, um, when they don't have, when it, they actually have pain during the menstrual flow, at least I think of other uh, processes, whether it be endometriosis, adenomyosis, et cetera. Uh, and of course, dysuria, always think just urinary tract infection or some urethral abnormality, urethral diverticula, always at least think about these things. If you are, once you feel comfortable with the diagnosis and you move on to therapy, but nothing is working, uh, you have to start to think, well, could there be another pain generator? And we do, for example, know that about 80, 85% of patients who have uh, ICBPS will have some uh, degree of pelvic floor uh, myalgia dysfunction that might cause symptoms. They may have vulvodynia, IBS, all sorts of different things that might be part of the process. Um, also, you may completely, completely off, off target and there may be no bladder problem at all. This is the general algorithm that has been described in the guidelines and I'm going to go over through them, but but I'm, I may deviate a little, I may add, I may take away some of these things as we go through them, because of course they are guidelines, you should know them for your boards, uh, and, uh, but uh, I'll give you some uh, caveats along the way when we use them and how things actually have been changing and are in the process of change. We generally start off with uh, conservative therapy as any process in, in urological uh, uh, circles. And, um, but of course, you have to modulate that dependent upon the severity of the patient's symptoms. So I can send them, for example, to the Interstitial Cystitis Association. We can work with dietary changes. But I can tell you, if they have severe symptoms right off the bat, to work with this kind of stepwise process really doesn't make a lot of sense. You may need to jump in with higher level care at an earlier time, depending on the specific clinical situation. Nevertheless, I can tell you this is a good website to know. It's a great 800 uh, number to know. Uh, lots of, um, of information, not only for patients, but for clinicians as well. They even keep people up to date on current grant activity in the field. So it's really a, a great organization. It also takes, a lot, takes away a lot of time from, uh, for the clinician in terms of explaining diets and all that's all on the website. I just want to bring, I was looking at this last night, I said, oh my gosh, look at this. This is a really, oh, five years ago, we were talking about the role of opioids in the treatment of chronic pelvic pain. You know, how things have changed, wow. Um, okay, so in, in staying in the same mode of conservative changes, uh, I want you to, there's a lot of talk about how uh, diet may affect uh, the symptoms of ICBPS. But I want you to know, and a lot of people have developed these tear-off sheets, just follow this diet, that's it. Well, no one's really proven any diet is specifically perfect for every patient. There are some, we've done studies, uh, basically they're all questionnaires of, and create, we've created histograms uh, literally to see uh, which 10 uh, comestibles, as we call them, tend to cause a problem and actually which tend to make things a little bit better for patients. But it should be told to every patient that not every patient is sensitive to every food. And just like medications, you can overdose with them too, or you can underdose. So if a, a food may be a problem, sometimes just taking less of it may let that patient have that piece of chocolate once in a while. I think it's always important to at least tell the patients about an elimination diet. Yes, caffeinated beverages, uh, alcoholic beverages, citrus fruits, etc., cetera, uh, can, uh, may, uh, spicy foods may tend to cause problems for many patients. But again, not every patient is diet sensitive. 
Also, if they think something might be causing a problem, they can start with a very bland diet and start to work some of these, what, you know, these potentially offensive agents or uh, foods and beverages back into the diet to actually see if it's a problem. One problem, just like the overactive uh, bladder patient, people just stop drinking. They end up, and here I'm going to take my sip of coffee here. They stop drinking. They don't want to pee so much. So what do they? So um, their urine becomes more concentrated. And they tend to actually get worsening of symptoms. And yes, they'll they will urinate more if they drink more. Yeah, but they need to get some type of moderation with all of this. There are some dietary supplements that have been found to be useful. Again, this is more by patient report more than anything. This calcium glycerol phosphate, which is also called pre-leaf, no one really understands how it works. Doesn't change the pH of the urine at all. In fact, it's really uh, marketed over the counter as a um, as a like a tums, like a like a an antacid. Um, uh, but it does seem to help a lot of patients, urinary alkalinization, uh, whether it be with some medications like polycitra or, or even baking soda have been useful. Baking soda, you have to just be careful with that because uh, it's a high sodium content for patients who are hypertensive. It's very, there, are, so there aren't a lot of studies on diet. This is one, this is a Japanese study uh, that's relatively recent, 2017. Uh, essentially, I'm not just gonna sort of cut to the chase here. Um, by uh, having the group patients into two, uh, into two groups, uh, patients who received some dietary uh, manipulation, but some uh, were, they went wild and crazy, uh, had a very, very uh, restrictive diet. Um, and they looked at, you can see this OSSI, OSPI, those are O'Leary Sand Symptom Index Problem Indices. Uh, they are just general, um, give us a general idea of uh, global um, um, aspects of what's going on with the patient's pain and urgency and so forth. And they found literally over a year uh, time that patients improved in every parameter that they, they looked at. So I think there is something to be said, uh, but again, I, I don't think that we should uh, make it this a hard and fast rule that every patient needs to be on a diet because it's just not true. Most patients, by the way, I think, and it just makes sense, know right off the bat, they walk in the door, they say, I've, I've, I've been there, done that. I, you know, I know that diet affects me, or some patients are discretion that I don't think so. There's no reason to, I don't, I don't think there's a, a significant reason to push them to make major changes. They can try it, but again, not, it wouldn't be the first on my list. I just want to show you, it's very interesting, the similarities between IC uh, patients and the chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain uh, patients, just that dietary changes seem to affect both groups, and you can see similar um, not identical, but very similar uh, 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 comestibles that make them, the patients better or worse. Uh, the interesting thing, as you can see on this list, is a lot of them affect the GI tract as opposed to the urinary tract, try from water. Uh, but that, of course, affects the GI tract as well. Um, and there's a, a lot of talk about this GI-GU crosstalk where we do know that patient symptoms tend to worsen when their GI complaints worsen. And that's been seen in, in animal models. And of course, we see this clinically when patients suffer from IBS, particularly I, uh, uh, constipation dominant IBS, their general urological symptoms will worsen. Self-help, bladdery training can be very helpful. We institute this immediately after any type of, whether it be a hydrodistension or uh, a bladder fulguration after a hunter lesion, uh, for a hunter lesions. Uh, my concern is that we're gonna cause some uh, scarring uh, in the bladder and by progressively trying to increase their volume uh, while they're feeling Uh, yoga primarily really good for uh, any associated pelvic problems. Biofeedback, e still can be helpful, usually done through physical therapy. Uh, I can say one person he has an incredible. Uh, they are uh, part of the, the regular therapy. Um, sorry, everybody. Um, seems like Dr. Moldwin's having an internet issue. 
Uh, just give us a second to get it back online. Can you hear me? Hey, Dr. Mulgoon, we can uh, we can hear you. Seems you like we're okay. perfect. Okay, so um, and I'll just move on. <laughs> uh, we we can't see the slides yet, though. Okay. Um, all right. Let me. Um, yeah, you know. can you make him host again? Yeah, it says I am host now, and I don't have any controls here. Um, I just see my slides. Um, May can you can you hear see me and hear me? We can see and hear you. We just can't uh, see yes, the PowerPoint. So, uh, hang on, let me just move back. Uh, let me go to Zoom. All right, hold on. I will get this. All right, I'm going to share my screen again. Thank God I know how to use computers. All right, <laughs> you got it. Do you see? Uh, me? Yep, we can see the slides. Right, I'm gonna. And then bigger now. All right. All right. Here we go. Perfect. Right. Let's move on. So let's go on to a little, uh, some medical therapy. Um, I write down here, rare, uh, frequently used, but really there's no literature on it, but the use of um, uh, urinary uh, anesthetics, whether it be medicines like uh, peridium or some of these medicines that usually are complex with methylene blue. Um, these, these medications are what I call the combo medicines that consist of an antispasmodic, an anti-infective, an analgesic. Interesting, they can be very helpful for some patients. They don't have very low content of hyoscyamine. They do have some anti-infective qualities. And it's thought that the phenyl salicylate, uh, not the methylene blue, interestingly, is the uh, agent that seems to provide some relief of bladder discomfort with filling. It's again a hit and miss deal with these agents, <coughs> but I think it's reasonable, especially if they're having a little bit of a flare, uh, can, be, can be helpful. Um, one of the only, the actually only current, uh, it's been around for probably about 30, or, well, about 30 years or so, uh, pentacin polysulfate sodium, uh, which is a brand name Elmron, is the only FDA approved oral medication for the treatment of IC. Um, it's considered to be a heparinoid. It's a long chain um, saccharide, uh, very monotonous, uh, very similar. It's a, basically a gag. It's a glycosaminoglycan. And as you can see in this little uh, immunofluorescence stain uh, for the, for the uh, gag layer, uh, that's a layer, of course, that is uh, helpful at preventing bacterial adherence. Um, it also binds water. It prevents uh, the ingress of uh, small solutes. Um, so it's a protective layer. Uh, there are some, some old data that uh, strongly suggest that there is some defect or some changes that occur in this layer that may allow uh, agents to get in, stimulate uh, the, the, the nerves of the bladder, cause inflammation in some patients and so forth, or just sensitize the area. And the idea behind this is a very small amount, perhaps only about two or three percent, will get into the urine unchanged and it's thought to augment the, the uh, layer. Of course, there are intravesical agents that are more direct, but this is um, at least thought to be the, its mechanism. Thought to be its mechanism of action. No one has actually ever bound it, as far as I know, to a radioisotope or any type of marker to see if it truly binds. Uh, early studies show 30 to 47 percent efficacy against about a 16 percent, 18 percent placebo. Uh, that's sort of a low placebo for IC patients, and I'll get into some of the more recent studies on it in a moment. But suffice to say, it, we clearly do see some patients uh, improve uh, to a quite a significant degree. Others, no improvement. And I just think that speaks to the heterogeneity of the entire population. I usually, if we're going to give this medication, it's usually a three-month trial. Probably about 5% uh, more may uh, improve after six months. But I don't, you know, that, that, that data does, those data don't really impress me. So I usually will just stop it at three months if, if we're not seeing any progress. The dosing is 100 milligrams three times per day. Uh, now let me give you the, the downside. So more recent studies uh, are not showing great efficacy of the medication. In fact, one of the more recent studies, uh, about five years ago is probably the most recent, is really showing uh, probably placebo does better than the, uh, the, the PPS. Uh, again, it may be population based or we, you know, is it a biased population? And I can tell you there's some work right now reconnoitering some of the old studies with this medication. And if we start to 
change the, you know, change, uh, um, sort of segregate the patient's uh, population out differently, we probably are, we probably are going to find uh, um, some uh, improvement in a, a subpopulation. So I, it's not necessarily medicine, even though it's FDA approved, I don't think it's, it's certainly not a, um, in my opinion, it's not, um, you know, a home run. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this talk today. Uh, but it is something to, to know about and to tell patients about and some of the, the good points and the bad points. The side effect profile seems to be relative. It's reasonable. It's anywhere from 1% to 4%. The most disconcerting thing for patients is the potential for alopecia. It's supposed to be in little patches, but usually what I see, at least in practice, is if it happens, it's happening more just diffuse type of hair loss. They'll see it in their, their brush. Um, uh, but interestingly, the GI effects, the, the dyspepsia, the diarrhea, nausea, uh, are probably the most uh, common effect. It does have some anticoagulant properties to it. Um, I don't think enough necessarily, at least in my practice, to, to stop it before any surgical procedures, but you should know about it if you want to be totally, if you're, uh, I, but I do know some clinicians that do stop it before, uh, before any, you know, uh, procedure that there might be a, a lot of bleeding. One of the most recent uh, concerns regarding this medication, uh, this, there are tons of blogs on this at this point, is the so, potential. It's an association, it's an epidemiologic study. Um, this is mainly through, um, through Emory and through, at this point, uh, the Kaiser, Kaiser Permanente out in California, uh, looking at a, a pigmentary maculopathy. Uh, they have these patients, uh, it's a small number of patients, but there's some concern, but it seems that a lot of these patients who have this pigmentary maculopathy um, have been on uh, pentasan for many years, often at high doses. So is it, a, is it a cause and effect relationship? We don't know. I mean, I, I usually are tell, I'm usually telling patients about it. Um, again, it's usually with chronic exposure long term, like over, you know, uh, 8, 10, 12 years and so forth. Um, so, uh, but I'll send them to the ophthalmologist just for a check. They, these patients tend to go to the, uh, to the ophthalmologist mainly because of these symptoms, which include blurred vision, dark problems with dark adaptation, and this metamorphopsia, uh, which is a different, is, according, uh, I had to look this one up, which is essentially if you're looking at vertical blinds, you may see them curving. Uh, so there's some distortion in, in, in vision in that sense. Uh, moving on to, I think, probably a, one of the more first line, even though it's not FDA approved for, for this, for, uh, for ICBPS, this tricyclic antidepressants really hold a sort of a central role. And uh, the one that's been uh, investigated and probably used more than any one of them has been amitriptyline. Uh, the doses usually start at 10, can go up to 75 or even more, uh, and it's usually given at night, and we'll get into why that's, that's, we, we do that. It's what's called a dirty drug. It has a lot of different effects, but uh, which make it not really that helpful to psychiatrists. Um, it has, but it, for urologists, it works out okay. Um, it has central and peripheral anticholinergic action. We do know that about 17 or so percent of, I, of ICDPS patients will have some overactivity of the bladder. Um, it does block pain. It seems to accomplish this through uh, blocking reuptake of serotonin, particularly norepinephrine in the central and peripheral nervous system. It functions also as a local anesthetic as a sodium channel blocker like lidocaine or, 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 um, uh, or, or bupivacaine. It also will get into antihistamines in a little while, but it also has some antihistaminic properties. Um, if you look at some of the studies of amitriptyline, there are two pretty much as a there are two placebo-controlled studies, one long-term study. Uh, the last study that was done was, uh, was actually uh, a randomized control trial, which was a, um, an NIH-sponsored uh, trial, um, um, was done in uh, 2010. Um, they didn't find actually any difference uh, with the medication uh, from placebo until you hit about 50 milligrams at night. In clinical practice, I have never seen that to be the case. We have patients on 10 or 20, and they've been doing well for years, uh, well beyond any placebo effect. And when they come off of it, they, 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 or they come down on their dosing, they do find some uh, worsening of symptoms. So uh, the low, you, know, you shoot for the lowest dosing in any medication that's going to be effective. So I wouldn't be uh, swayed by that particular study. Um, 
all the tricyclic antidepressants, you should know what their side effects are. Uh, and as you can see here, the constipation is pretty one, number one, two, and three. Uh, many of these patients, as I mentioned, will come in with constipation dominant IBS. And if they are constipated when they start this, they will not be happy. Um, so you really need to clear that before you get going with that. A lot of patients are younger. They are going to sleep, uh, I don't know, nowadays with COVID, but they're, you know, they're, getting, they're going to sleep at like two o'clock in the morning and they have to wake up for work. Well, there you write QHS on your prescription pad and they're writing, uh, well, they don't make prescription pads anymore. You click it into your EMR um, and you, uh, what do you call it? And uh, you put, get, click the QHS in there and they take it before they go to sleep. They're never gonna wake up in the morning. Uh, you know, they're just gonna be really groggy. So you really need to back up the dose. I usually tell patients to take it around seven, uh, you know, seven, eight o'clock at night, assuming they're going to bed around uh, 10 or 11. Uh, of course, it has anticholinergic effects, urinary retention, dry mouth. And I want to pay attention to that urinary retention because some of these patients are dysfunctional avoiders. So if they come in, I have urinary hesitancy. I don't feel like I'm emptying. I have to push and strain. Not a good, you better watch out. Don't start those patients on, uh, you know, on moderate or high doses. You want to really be careful with that. These medications, all of them, including the antihistamines, have this little potential to, to make it easier to gain weight. I usually tell patients sort of one Oreo cookie is now three Oreo cookies, so um, you have to be careful with that. In men, it's very helpful for premature ejaculation. In women, it can also decrease uh, sex drive and really inhibit uh, ability to orgasm any of these meds, including the, uh, uh, many of the antidepressants beyond the uh, tricyclics. Palpitations, if a patient does have a cardiac history, I usually will get this, I will uh, send them to their cardiologist or their internist to clear, to clear the medication because it can um, um, in, influence uh, cardiac conduction. So uh, important thing to, to uh, keep in mind. And if you hear the patient has palpitations, they can't take them in, that's all that comes down to. But again, watch out with that, that last one, particularly in the elderly population. And just remember, tricyclic antidepressants and, uh, and our anticholinergics and even the antihistamines, uh, when used in the elderly, remember those associations between this and pre-senile dementia, Alzheimer's and, and so forth. So we want to uh, uh, counsel our patients as far as that's concerned. So how to use this medicine most effectively? Again, start with a low dose. You don't want to start with a high dose. If you start with 25 milligrams and the patient has an adverse event, I guarantee you they're never going to want to take the medicine again. They'll never take 10. Okay, so better to start with a low, work their way up, and the patients can do that themselves. Every week they can go up by 10 milligrams or so. Uh, of course, increase the dose as the patient tolerates it. Uh, take the dose at dinner time, not at bedtime, as I mentioned. And remember, no constipation with this medicine. It, you'll, you'll make them worse. And watch out for those voiding dysfunction patients. There are alternatives. Um, uh, nortriptyline is, uh, amitriptyline is a tertiary amine. Nortriptyline is a secondary amine. Amitriptyline literally gets converted to, to nortriptyline. Nortriptyline uh, comes in only a capsule form, so you can't actually cut it in half or play around with it like that. But it does have a, uh, some, uh, probably a little bit better side effect profile. Doesn't seem to work quite as effectively, but again, if the patient's having, uh, not tolerating the amitriptyline, you can try that. And again, other uh, uh, anti um, tricyclics you can try. Imipramine is one I tend to stay away from mainly because it's good for urinary incontinence. But again, for those people who have you know, uh, some dysfunctional voiding problems, you'll make them worse with that medication on top of the anticholinergic effects. So antihistamines, we're gonna go into real quickly. Um, they, that's one of the other medicines, staple medicines we use. It's the same basic doses as the uh, tricyclics, uh, but they can be used, uh, and they can be used side by side. Uh, sometimes you can get up to a certain dose on the amitriptyline. You can't go any further. They're getting one side effect or another, the constipation, et cetera, but they're still not sleeping. And I, sometimes we'll add an antihistamine, 10, 25 milligrams at night. And that seems to help. Uh, there is data. The theory behind this, at least, is that, um, that, it, uh, that there are higher histamine, uh, 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 there's higher histamine content in the bladder of afflicted patients. Uh, there also see, you see uh, early uh, scan, um, uh, scanning electromicro, uh, uh, electromicroscopic studies to show uh, uh, degranulated uh, uh, um, 
uh, actually I think it's transmission electro, electron microscopy, showed uh, uh, degranulated mast cells in uh, these patients. So there's a lot of activity uh, mast cell wise and therefore the, uh, again the content behind this. I just find it helpful to help the patients uh, sleep a little bit better at night. It does have some uh, impact I think on their nocturia. Not, no really good, no good RCT has been done on this medication. Uh, the one that has been done it has not shown particular efficacy. I think again uh, I think that may be related to a heterogeneity of the population. Uh, Semetidine, I'm not going to spend a long time on this. It is part of the AUA update, you know, on the protocols. And it's in there because there are some double-blind uh, RCTs that have been done. Um, just effectively, I, I, it's not part of my arsenal. Um, I just have never found these to be particularly helpful as these uh, two studies. Uh, I'm not saying not to use it, but I, I, I just, I, I, in clinical practice, haven't found them to be particularly um, uh, helpful for patients. Other, other uh, medications that I think can be helpful and are not in your guidelines, but I'm not going to dwell on them, are anti-seizure medications. The nice thing about these medications is that we know uh, that, you know, I see 75%, uh, and this is more through the, through the MAPA network, I see um, is really comprised, as I mentioned, it's a heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous population, and probably about 75% of them may, they may have bladder problems, but there's a lot of other things that are going on well beyond the bladder. Uh, there are a lot of global aspects uh, that, of course, you see in many patients, whether it be vulvodynia, migraine headache, IBS, all these different things, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, uh, and others. Um, and I don't know whether these anti-seizure medications, some of which are indicated for those, for those other conditions, are helpful. It's helpful on bladder, uh, for bladder uh, problems, but they do seem to help many of our patients. Uh, this is the gabapentin and the uh, pregabalin. Um, they're relatively easy medications to learn how to use. Again, similar slow, uh, low dose to start with and uh, slowly uh, grading up on dosing. But I'm not going to dwell on that just for the sake of time. They're not, I don't, they're not uh, classically part of uh, guidelines, at least uh, through the, through the um, uh, current guidelines. Another one that you might consider is uh, Cymbalta, uh, excuse me, which is deloxetine. Uh, this also has a selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibition. Uh, and has also been helpful. It's pretty easy dosing. We usually start at 20 and go up to 60 milligrams per day. It does have, it doesn't, none of these medications, these anti-seizure medications have significant effect on the, on the, um, on bladder activity, which is really good. We move into a direct attack on the bladder with intravesical agents. Uh, here you can see the only other uh, FDA approved medication for uh, ICDPS and that is dimethyl sulfoxide. It comes as something called RIMSO50, which is a 50% DMSO solution. Uh, DMSO is an incredible solvent. It, if you touch it, it gets right through your keratinized epithelium of your skin. You'll taste it in your mouth literally within a minute. Um, it does get excreted to some degree through the alveoli, and you get patients typically get a garlic-type odor to their breath. Uh, they should be told about this. When you first give this medication, it will tend to pop the medication in their bladder. Um, we usually ask them to hold it for about a half hour. Um, it will usually, and patients are told this, is usually gonna make their symptoms worse, at least for the th first, anywhere from the first one to three or fourth uh, treatment, we'll usually give about eight treatments uh, to see how they're doing. They're usually done on a weekly basis. It's sort of become convention not to give this 50% DMSO solution directly. Usually I water it down with various other uh, agents that at least have some theoretical action on uh, pathologies that have been found in the bladder in uh, this population. So trimcinolone, heparin sodium is uh, sort of analogous to heparin um, sulfate, which is one of the glycosaminoglycan components of the bladder surface mucin, sodium bicarbonate. Uh, I usually put some gentamicin in the solution not to kill, it more of as a prophylactic measure. Uh, but keep in mind, that's the only other medication that's been used. Do I think this is a, um, another slam dunk for patient improvement? No, uh, but it does help uh, some patients. There's no question about it. And some patients, surprisingly, you'd think would do horribly, uh, horribly on it. And they do quite well. I, for example, Hunter lesion patients, I was very concerned about even putting this into a, one of their bladders uh, 
Uh, but uh, after doing it the first time and the patient having like market improvement after the first just like one or two installations, I started doing it more frequently and um, it does seem to help, particularly when other uh, therapies are failing. One thing that's really become uh, staple, in, at least in, in my practice and many uh, practices around uh, the globe uh, is the use of intravesical uh, anesthetics. Uh, for some, uh, I'm not sure, I don't know if anyone really truly knows the, the, uh, the, the mechanism, but these are anesthetics, for example, uh, Marcaine, which is bupivacaine and, and, and lidocaine. That if I put that into anybody's bladder, it should have a, a duration of action for probably about three to five hours. Uh, oftentimes you see these patients feeling improved for days, weeks, and uh, sometimes they'll go a month without needing another installation. Uh, so um, we interestingly started using this little combination to help make a diagnosis of interstitial cystitis bladder pain syndrome, because the idea is if you put an anesthetic in someone's bladder and their pain drops down, you know that some component at least of that pain that they're perceived to be in their pelvis is probably coming from their bladder. So that's actually part of the Canadian guidelines for working up IC, which I sort of, you know, have always moved along with. Um, we, again, just as I call them sort of, to some degree, voodoo solutions, you're putting in heparin, trimsilone, other things that hopefully will have some clinical impact on the patient's symptoms. But again, the key players in this, uh, in this cocktail, I think, are the anesthetics. Um, the patients can even do the Medicaid, they can do installations themselves. We often teach, teach patients to do this. If they're having a flare, they just put the catheter in and they can go out to the movies. It gives them a, a real level of empowerment, which I think is so important in any kind of chronic uh, condition. You know, I can take care of myself, right? One interesting thing about uh, lidocaine and, and a lot of these uh, sodium channel blockers is that as you alkalinize them, uh, they become uh, 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 more nonpolar, uh, which means also that they can pass through the bladder surface mucin uh, and get to, uh, and have deeper penetration. So that might enhance in, uh, efficacy, uh, but it also will drive it into the bloodstream to some degree. And that's why I usually don't alk. I, we, we often alkalinize lidocaine solutions because it has a very short uh, half-life. Uh, we don't usually do high concentration uh, uh, solutions for that reason. Uh, but I really do stay away from bupivacaine because uh, alkalinizing bupivacaine because that can then actually have some cardiotoxic effects. So again, that's just a little, I, I don't think there's any reported uh, problem with it, but it's just, again, more theoretical than anything else. So I gave you some ideas of what can be used, anesthetics, DMSO. Some people are just popping heparin in. In Canada, they're even using hyaluronic acid, which again is a glycose, which is one of the components of, of a bladder surface mucin. But just to can show you where people have been, people have put in chlorpactin, which is pretty much similar to Clorox uh, in the bladder. Uh, I think that goes back to the days of tuberculosis. Um, uh, and there were concerns of uh, reflux and, and so forth and ureteral scarring. So we sort of stay away from those types, silver nitrate, uh, even BCG. Uh, even hot peppers, capsaicin. Um, so all these things have been looked at. Um, but I think in general practice, as you're getting out there, uh, if you just have a good handle on anesthetics and the DMSO, and maybe using them as cocktail solutions, I think you'll do quite well. And I would really encourage any uh, practice to, to work with uh, teaching patients, you know, the self-therapy. It really does um, uh, improve their quality of life. The biggest pushback that we've been getting is from insurance companies because they don't want to pay for the medications then. They'll, put, they'll pay for it in the office because they won't pay for it uh, for the patients to do it at home. Does that make sense? No. Um, Hydrodistension. Uh, this is a, a, a procedure that used to be used in the evaluation of interstitial cystitis bladder pain syndrome, we would see typical findings. You'd see a low, what we call an anesthetic bladder capacity. You would see uh, little, um, uh, what are called glomerulations developed submucosally. Uh, we know that the findings were really not all that sensitive and specific for uh, IC, and that's sort of come out of favor. It's still being used almost uniformly in, uh, in Europe and elsewhere in, on, along the globe. 
Uh, the problems, the, the, where I'm putting it in the, the treatment section is because some people do get some improvement in symptoms afterwards. I don't use this as a go-to um, therapy because if it does um, help them, it usually helps them. They usually go through three weeks feeling miserable. If it helps them in about 50% of times, it'll help them for maybe three months, sometimes longer. Um, but then they'll get their symptoms back. And I'm always worried that, you know, by quote, traumatizing the bladder, we're going to cause more problems for them in, in the long run, axonal sprouting, scarring, uh, and, and, and other things. But these are the types of findings one might see in, in some of the IC patients. You can see uh, mucosal tears. You see these classic glomerulations. And interesting, just as a point uh, of, of a knowledge point, the anesthetic bladder capacity, that ABC, of course, your normal bladder capacity for maybe 500 cc's systemically, uh, 800 to 1200 when you're <clears throat> when you're out when you're out on the OR table under general anesthesia, uh, and that's at a, a pressure of about 60 to 80 uh, centimeters of water. That's hanging the, the water bag up there and letting it run in and watching it at all times. There are problems that people have described after hydrodistension, um, particularly people who have had therapy directed therapy to their bladder previously. Uh, this is a bladder necrosis. Uh, two of the three patients that they describe in this study um, had chlorpl chlorpactin uh, therapy uh, at some point earlier. But, um, you know, so it's uh, even these benign, you think they're benign procedures, you can get into, have problems with them. I want to go up again in the therapeutic ladder here. Uh, this is um, usually reserved for uh, people who uh, are uh, this is a higher tier therapy, so to speak, uh, sacral neuromodulation. And of course, it is not FDA. It is in our guidelines, uh, IC guidelines. Uh, it is not FDA approved for that purpose. I usually, and you'll see in the literature that you're going to get the best results uh, for patients. Yes, they may have pelvic pain and bladder-based pain, but the patients who you're going to see the best results are the patients who do complain of uh, have some component of urinary urgency or painful urgency or some need to get to uh, having difficulty deferring a visit to the bathroom. So um, that's where I think uh, this, this particular device is really going to shine. Um, I think it also is going to shine where uh, patients have concomitant bladder uh, floor dysfunction, you know, um, pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, patients who have difficulty, urinary hesitancy, they're, they're, uh, um, the sensation of incomplete voiding, you're seeing a start, an interrupted flow pattern on, on uh, your flowometry. Uh, um, and some of these patients may not even empty their bladder when you just do PVR checks. So again, uh, it, it does have, I think, uh, a role over here. Okay, let's keep on moving up here. Um, I wanted to just show you where the, <clears throat> the previous um, AUA guidelines were. As you can see down here, you see where it says intradetrusor botulinum toxin A. This is onobotulinum toxin. This is the Botox. It used to be as fifth line therapy over with cyclosporin, and we sort of moved it over with neuromodulation. And that's mainly because um, the safety, you know, we looked at safety and efficacy, and it was uh, seemed to be pretty safe, especially with uh, the, the data that was found with overactive bladder, only about 6% of patients, that's only, 6% of patients uh, having problems with urinary uh, retention. Um, in any patient with IC, because there's such a, what I see at least is a, a high um, a prevalence of concomitant um, uh, bladder avoiding dysfunction, just be very cautious when you're using it, uh, um, Botox injections into the bladder uh, in any patient who's describing urinary hesitancy, or you can see is, is having some difficulties with uh, uh, bladder outlet issues. Um, but <clears throat> when you give it in a different, uh, when you do give it in an appropriate patient, and this is probably the best study out there, this is from uh, 2018 uh, um, Journal of Urology, you can see uh, giving 100 units, mainly into the trigone uh, area, uh, basically along the base of the bladder. We're not giving it uh, uh, like a typical um, uh, template for OAB, but when you do uh, administer the agent uh, in this area, which is thought to be higher uh, density of afferrin fibers versus, uh, versus um, um, you know, um, motor fibers, um, you do get some interesting improvements in pain. Um, you're looking at symptom scores improving. 
Um, this is pain, symptom and, and a problem scores. This is that O'Leary SAND score that I was mentioning earlier on that diet study. Um, so there are significant differences and I think we're gonna see more of this in the future, hopefully. Small study, of course. Um, with this, the only purpose of me showing you this particular uh, slide is really to show you the next slide, which shows, whoops, I thought I was going to say the repeated injections, okay? The fact that as if you give a patient an injection and their symptoms improve, their pain scores improve, um, they will slowly have return of their pain and, and other urological symptoms over just like the OAB patients, but giving them another injection, just like the OAB patients, seems to produce similar results, which is really wonderful to see. You're not seeing that tachyphylaxis develop that was of concern in, in, when we were uh, using these medications earlier. We were afraid of antibodies and developing and then, uh, and then uh, poor efficacy, but again, not seeing this. But you do need repeated injections. Okay, so what I want to do in my final is really to, uh, in the, my final words to you this morning uh, is really to get into what to do with uh, some of the more difficult patients, and that's uh, these are the patients who have Hunter lesions. We don't call them Hunter ulcers. I left that there because I forgot to take it out the side, basically. But I got to change that. Um, this is a before and after shot of a Hunter lesion. We always biopsy these these guys because we just want to make sure they're not a carcinoma in situ hanging out over there. Here and there we'll get different pathologies. So, uh, but after you, um, after you fulgurate them, and this is just with a Bugby electrode, you can see a gentle touching with it, with just 10, 10, 10 coag, zero cutting current, you can see this crazy reaction. This area blanches and the whole area around it turns uh, beet red. You'll see edematous reactions occurring. And this is probably secondary to all the nasty um, inflammatory mediators that are hanging out in the area. So that's a release of bradykinin, the, the histamine release, all you get this edematous reaction. And I always tell our residents, you know, you sort of have to sort of mark these off before you start because you can start chasing your tail. You burn this, it becomes bigger, and then it becomes larger and larger. So we try to stay focused on the initial site of the, uh, of the lesion. So uh, if you want to do a very simple thing, I've heard of this even being done in the office setting. I don't know how you can do it. I just you can, you can get bleeding with these things too. So I tend not to do that because again, the patients are in pain to begin with. Why do that? But um, people have used roller balls. That's fine. I usually just use a six, uh, number six Bugby electrode, low coag, no current um, mark, as I mentioned, the edges of the lesion before you start. Um, I would, you'll see a lot of literature about doing a, hydro, a concomitant hydrodistension. I mean, if you're going to do that, I would be very careful because what happens is when you start to stretch the bladder, what do you think is going to have? This air is going to traumatize. It's going to start to bleed sometimes heavily. Um, and also all that uh, edematous reaction will start to expand and you'll never know where you're going to be fulgurating at that point. So um, I try to avoid that. If I'm going to do a hydrodistension, I'll actually do a little mild one under vision um, uh, after I do the fulguration, but really uh, very, very cautiously, because again, very easy to, to create a bladder tear and to actually uh, have a perforation at that site. Uh, as I mentioned here, this is a study we did a few years back, uh, just to show that there's a fall off. Uh, these are not, I always tell patients, this is sort of like having uh, psoriasis of the bladder. If it's in one area, it's just as likely, it's a field change, it's going to occur in other areas. And there's some recent data looking at the uh, histopathology of Hunter lesions versus uh, the quote non-Hunter lesions in the same patient's bladder, and there are similar findings. So there is definitely a drop off. Um, you you know uh, usually will give them a good year or two of, of uh, improvement. Uh, the reason that the, the uh, patients dropped off, the, the way we 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 show this drop off is the patients need to have a, another fulguration. So they say, please, you know, my pain's coming back. I need to do this again. Uh, Hunter's lesions by themselves will cause scarring. Uh, if you just leave them alone, they'll just do it all by themselves. And, you know, my biggest concern is when we fulgurate, uh, we're going to co be causing our own problems. You know, we're actually going to be um, producing scar ourselves. And although that's not proven, it's something of concern to me. Um, so I usually, um, and this is, these are the kinds of things that you'll see in the bladder, these kind of arching areas, banding scar, 
which really limit the bladder capacity. Uh, it's really, you can see why, what's holding things up. Um, we call them bladder synechiae. And we, in this one patient, we even, I'm just going to, just to not prolong things, we even cut into this. We, we, we lysed that whole area. We even went down into perivesical fat. We left a, a, and we got probably an extra 30 cc's volume, which is another hour, an hour and a half of uh, avoiding relief for that patient. So she did well just by cutting through there. Uh, because I want to uh, not take up too much time, of course, uh, we can always inject these lesions. And triamcinolone seems to be the agent of choice. You can use all sorts of needles. Uh, we use the Labore endoscopic injection needle. I just like the idea that it's, um, you know, you can get a, a specific level, depth of penetration. But for the residents there who are not used to using it, you can perforate a bladder if you just stick this thing in too hard. So you have to be careful. It's very, um, you, have, you do have to be careful with it. But here's a typical uh, small lesion. Of course, I'm going to show you the best slide I have uh, because once you inject it, you can get a lot of bleeding. They tend to be very inflamed areas, uh, but that you'll create a nice bleb over there. And I just want to show you these very interesting shots just to show the, how cool this is. On the left, you can see the Hunter lesion. On the right, you can see looking back after a bunch of months, you can see that little, that little, those little, uh, sorry, I, uh, you can see the, 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 the small areas of triamcinolone there, and there's no, there's no inflammation at all any longer. So, uh, 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 and they also, you don't see any tethered bladder mucosa. You see nothing there. So I think we've accomplished our goal. Uh, cyclosporin um, has really uh, been more popularized uh, these days amongst people who work with IC patients. Um, it has a really pretty good success rate, specifically with Hunter lesion patients. With patients who do not have Hunter lesions, I really, it's, it's not great efficacy, and there are, still are no randomized uh, controlled trials here. Uh, but the success rate uh, that we see, and the, the numbers are small, of course, uh, but they, it is pretty profound what we've been what, you know, what we've been seeing in clinical practice, really a reduction of improvement in pain, urgency, frequency, and also a reduction in terms of the severity of inflammatory disease in these patients. So um, it's something uh, where I use it in clinical practice is often the patients who have really diffuse inflammatory disease in their bladder, and there's no way I can burn all that. If they're focal lesions, we can do it. When it's diffuse, it's really tough to do that. So we'll give them cyclosporin. It'll sort of uh, confine the lesions and we'll uh, finish up. And of course- Hey, Dr. Failure... Moldwin, just wanted to let you know, we got about two minutes um, and then we finish got- them... Yep, okay. if that's all right. Not problem. Yep. All right, thank you. Uh, failure of uh, medical management, of course, ileal conduits, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know urine... simple urinary diversion might be perfectly reasonable. Uh, you can leave the bladder in situ, and there's some, uh, there's some, um, there ha have been some publications showing patients can do just fine just by not having urine running through there. Uh, we tend to remove the bladder, at least at our institution, when it has to happen, and we'll do a simple procedure as opposed to any type of pouch-based procedure. We were doing these super trigonal cystectomies where you remove just basically all the bladder except for the trigone and replace it with bowel, uh, a cecosisto, uh, an ileocecosystoplasty or just an ileocystoplasty. Uh, and um, the problem is you often, these are often hunter lesion patients, they'll develop inflammatory disease right at the suture line and then you have a problem. And keep in mind, these patients will need to catheterize postoperatively, so that's going to be an issue as well. So yeah, so the two-minute rule is good. Because <laughs> where are we going in the future? Uh, we got a lot of things in the pipeline. I think the fact that the epidemiology has changed, we think that there are probably somewhere about, somewhere between about four and maybe, uh, maybe four or five million women in the United States and probably about perhaps two million or more men in the United States with um, ICBPS. So I think that's sort of the stimulus to get a lot of um, you know, industry involved involved in, uh, in developing strategies of care for patients. So again, I think we're going to uh, see that more and more and more FDA approvals for uh, probably therapies that are even already out there. That's it. All right. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Moldwin. I think um, we all appreciated that talk. It was very informative and covered something that definitely shows up on our boards and in-service um, and I think can, can be a little bit confusing for some of the uninitiated. So um, 
really appreciate your time and, and your explanations on that. 